about now, guys? Yeah, actually, I checked. Good. Uh, because I was a little bit worried because uh, when I'm playing PowerPoint slides, yeah, the desktop input is not actually picking up the things we're looking for. That's a little bit odd, isn't it? Display capture. Yeah, it's going off entirely. It seems that whenever I play the sides, things go bad. Okay, slide complication. No worries, there's a backup. So then that's not play the slide like this. Okay, one second, there we go. Let me play it this way. Center view. No, it's still not working. for the technical problem. Let's see if it's working this time. So instead of uh, playing the, the slideshow, um, I'm gonna just show the, the app. So let's see if this is working. Okay, seems to be working. Volume is low, okay, so let me tune up. Okay, this is about the loudest. Too loud? <laughs> okay, so you just uh, keep giving me feedbacks and we'll see. So next is, hmm, it's jumping by itself. 
for some reason <laughs> I I didn't touch I didn't do anything the PowerPoint slide just kind of uh, skipped itself that's all Okay, so uh, let me make it really simple then. need a new laptop but uh, let's see let's see how things will work today might be better. Okay, so let's start. And we'll start from a quick review of what we've talked about last Tuesday. So it was a week ago. So we started actually talking about the overview of chapter two. So there are a few things that we need to recap. Okay, so there are a number of these architectures available, possible. Okay, so the first one is called the client server. The other, peer-to-peer, -peer, and of course you can combine the two principles and one working for one of the components in the system and the other for other components in the system. Okay. And we actually talk about a few examples. Right? For example, dub-dub-dub is a client-server uh, architecture application. And then there are bitcoins or uh, BitTorrents being P2P. And then you see an example of Skype uh, using a centralized server for directory, for user IP address lookup. But for the calls, it's P2P, directly between the two peers. Okay. And we talk about the processes. Okay. And processes are running on the socket. And for each socket, we give it a <laughs> poor number because there could be multiple processes running on the same machine. To distinguish all these processes, we give each of these processes an IP address. Oh, sorry, a poor number. Okay. So HTTP runs on 80, mail on 25. And it's also these poor numbers we use to connect to the transport layers. And we talk about, hey, for each protocol we define, the messages we're sending, right, between the client and server, between the peer to peer, we send messages to each other. What are these messages? Okay, so oftentimes in the protocols, they, we define different types okay, of messages. And for each type, we define the syntax okay, and semantics. And then there'll be some rules defining what each of these entities will take, actions. Okay, what actions each of these will take. And some protocols are more public and some are more private. And we talk about the QoS. These are quite important because uh, data integrity is essentially talking about whether there's loss or not. So it corresponds to the first metric we use to measure internet, isn't it? Um, loss, second metric timing, which is delay. Third, throughput fourth, security. 
So apart from what we've talked about in chapter one, the metrics for internet performance, we see one more here, security. So quality of service that you're providing, depending on the nature of these applications, you might want to worry about whether, hey, you're sending the data with loss or not loss, with short delay or long delay, with uh, high throughput or low throughput. And of course, uh, Nowadays, whether it's secure transmission or non-secure, that's another issue. And we went through a few examples, right? Typically for file text-based transfer, it's um, no loss, elastic, and not time sensitive. So it's up here. Okay. But for audio video, you see that there are loss tolerance, that they do have higher throughput requirement uh, but in the meantime, shorter delay. For store audio video, if you recall the difference is what? The time sensitivity for stored audio video, it's a little bit more tolerable. Okay, so we could have higher uh, delay. Now, there are two different, these two additional kinds, interactive games and text messaging. So these are somewhat, somewhat different from text-based applications, typical text-based applications and different from the typical audio video applications, isn't it? Interactive games, hey, this is a little bit like the real-time audio video, but unlike audio video, there is high throughput requirement. The interactive games are not. Mm. Game data are very small because essentially you send, for example, your coordinates in the game. Okay, so in, a, in typical games, there's virtual coordinates, there's a game world, Okay. If you move around, you send the virtual coordinates, and those are very small messages. Okay. Although you see on your uh, display, lots of uh, pretty graphics are being rendered, but it's all your uh, GPU doing the work. Okay. The server is not rendering these uh, graphics for you. So between the client to the server, are there very short messages sent? Okay. So interactive games, different from real audio video, it's kind of in between text and audio video, but real-time requirement. Okay. Text messaging is uh, growingly different now, okay? unlike the regular text-based communication. The regular text-based communication, such as email, you do not expect instant replies. But instant messages, do you? Uh, some of you do care, right? And so uh, that is because of the habit Okay, we're using them now. Now we're checking it pretty much all the time. Right. And you know that uh, for these apps, uh, the system delay is typically short. Uh, the long part is the human delay. So the, the guy you're uh, texting to. So make sure that if you're uh, implementing a text messaging system, the delay is short so that people cannot blame. Uh, the other side, okay, that uh, they are communicating. And today, okay, let's try to finish the remaining part of uh, uh, 2.1. All right, so uh, on the black, uh, blackboard or whiteboard here, what I'm actually depicting, so let me just tilt the camera a little bit. So mm -hmm. these are actually the all the essential points uh, we would need to take a closer look about, okay, when we're talking about an application layer protocol. So essentially, uh, the architecture of the application layer protocol, okay, the message definitions, okay, including type, syntax, semantics, and the actions okay, defined by these rules. The port number used okay, for the server or for multiple servers. QoS, and lastly, the transport layer protocols. If you recall the layer uh, protocol stack, uh, protocols at each layer requires knowledge of the higher layers, how it's working with minimum APIs. Also, minimum APIs to lower layers. So when we are talking about one particular protocol in a layer, we also need to talk about hey, what's up there and what's down there, okay, because they are all related. So when we're talking about the application layer protocol, which is at the top, uh, we then still need to care. Uh, what is the transport layer protocol there helping this application layer protocol to transmit the packet? Okay. 
there are two options uh, you probably recall, TCP, UDP, right, the major ones. Uh, today you're gonna hear SSL or TLS. Uh, that protocol is to provide uh, the fourth QoS security. Okay. TCP, UDP, you will hear in a little bit that none of them, TCP, UDP, none of them provide security. All right, so let's start. TCP and UDP. So the first bullet here essentially describe the basic differences between the two protocols. Okay. One is reliable, the other is unreliable. All right, so we'll come back to UDP in a little bit. Oh, I see students doing something. Let me check whether how things are doing, how things are going. It's great right now. The volume is quite good now. Great, thank you. And I hope the, the video is also reasonable. You can see the slides that I'm going to. Okay, uh, just let me know okay, how things are going. Now, we'll come back to UDP in a little bit. Okay, let's focus on TCP. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is flow control and condition control. These tools are actually two additional functions. So TCP not only works in a reliable way, okay. it also tries to control itself, okay, and control particularly how fast the sender side is sending out these packets. All right. Um, if you think about uh, when we're talking about throughput, right, sender and destination, uh, pipes in the middle, right? The eventual throughput is going to be limited by what? The thinnest pipe, right? The bottleneck. Mm. Now consider this situation. From the source to the destination, all the pipes in the middle are big, but the entry point at the receiver is very narrow. What's going to happen? Flood at the receiver, isn't it? Overflow. Receiver being overflow. So that's not good either, isn't it? Mm. How do we prevent such an overflow at the receiver? Well, all the pipes in the middle are big, right? So that means the source might need to slow down. So flow control here means the sender won't be overwhelming uh, receivers okay, by sending too much data within a short amount of time. So in a way, you can probably picture, imagine, the receiver is sending some message back to the sender okay, in TCP, telling the sender side to slow down. Hey, I'm overwhelmed. Okay. Flood here, stop. So full control is a functionality in TCP that is to try to adjust the sending rate. Now, congestion control is a little bit different from flow control. Congestion control is more uh, where you have what? Big pipe coming from the source. But in the middle of the network, there's a thin pipe so that there's a overflow in the middle of the network. All right. So congestion control here is still asking the source to slow down. But it's for a slightly different situation. Okay, so the result of doing congestion control is so that we throttle the sender such that it's not sending too much traffic to overload the network. Okay, so flow control here to not overload the receiver. Congestion control here to not overload the network. And these two are kind of uh, the weaknesses or the, the, the disadvantages okay, of TCP. Okay, although TCP tried to provide reliable transfer, tried to control the sending rate, it does not guarantee the delay is gonna be smaller, lower than a th certain threshold or a certain requirement. It does not guarantee the throughput is gonna be high enough to send an audio or video stream. It does not guarantee anything else except that the data is gonna be received reliably. And on top of that, it does not guarantee security at all. Okay, so the data we send over TCP, if there is no encryption at the application level, it's plain text. Okay. Oh, 
end, look at this. TCP, hmm. in order to begin uh, sending data, there's some amount of time required okay, to set it up. Okay, so the sending side and the receiver side, uh, at the startup phase, needs to exchange messages so that they can establish a connection. Okay, so therefore, TCP is also a connection-oriented transport protocol. UDP, on the other hand, uh, does not do that. Okay. So pretty much, UDP doesn't do anything. Okay, so there's no reliability, no flow control, no congestion control, no security as well, no guarantee of timing, no guarantee of throughput. Uh, but there's no connection set up time. And without doing full control, congestion control, without doing reliable transfer, uh, you can also imagine the sender receiver of UDP. Do they need to send messages between each other all that often? Probably not. Mm. So UDP, very simple, but could be effective for some applications. So the question below here is, if UDP is not doing anything, why keeping it? Uh, think about it, okay? Something that I can actually um, help you, okay, thinking and come up with something that uh, answers the question is this. How about thinking uh, TCP service being the registered mail service? And the UDP service being the what? Regular mail service. We do have registered mail and the regular mail, isn't it? And one, if we have already the registered mail service, why are we keeping the regular ones? If you have a postcard to send, are you going to send it through register or the regular? Uh, those who say register, raise your hand. You guys can also vote. Okay, let me see. Okay. Okay. There's a delay to you to make the YouTube reviewer, uh, viewers, so it will take some time. Oh, okay. The regular one is cheaper. Ah, okay. I think you're getting to it. Uh, those who say uh, you will send it through regular, raise your hand. Oh, okay, guys, I'm seeing all the hands up here okay, in the class. Uh, why? Because postcards, uh, you care less whether it's uh, arriving at the receiver, isn't it? It's just a good greeting. Okay. It's not like it's critical if you lose it. But if you are, for example, um, asking uh, PC home to send you your receipt, okay, so that you can uh, uh, go to the post office or family mart to get your 200 uh, reward in case it matches the, the award numbers, right? Uh -huh. If you get the, if you win the award with your receipt, okay, would you like PC home sending it as a regular mail or register mail? Register mail, raise your hand. Exactly, okay. Uh, so lower costs, uh, some content, it's okay if it gets lost. Uh, register mail TCP, higher cost, okay. But in case it's important information, we'll just have to do that. But then get, to the, uh, get back to the point. None of these provide security, okay. And so this is kind of a table sharing uh, which of these applications are nowadays using TCP and which of these uses uh, t uh, UDP? But sometimes TCP. If you look at the first uh, four rows, email, remote terminal access, this is uh, SSH or tel uh, Telnet. Web or file transfer, all these okay, are done through TCP. But streaming audio video and internet telephony. Okay. So what I'm doing now as well, um, in the older, e older time, mostly UDP. 
but nowadays more TCP. In fact, uh, for example, YouTube. YouTube is sending the videos over HTTP over TCP. By the way, HTTP is the protocol for web transfer. Okay. So YouTube here, hey guys, uh, the videos you're seeing are through TCP. That's odd, isn't it? TCP is uh, more expensive, potentially delay longer as well. Why? Think about it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That takes us to the first quiz uh, this week. It's uh, quiz number six, so we move to the Slack space. Let's see, it's down here. So multimedia are sent through TCP or UDP choices of the engineer for the application. Uh, internet telephony, UDP or TCP. Now what about game? Okay, pretend that you are designing a game okay, and designing the transportation part of the game. Okay. Okay. Should these games traffic be transmitted using TCP or UDP? Okay, pick the one you find fit okay, for each of these three games and tell why. So there are three. The first one is called the Farm Wheel. Have you played this before? Uh huh. Too young to play this? Mm -hmm. It was an old game. I think it was more than 10 years ago. Right? Were you born? Probably not. Or maybe in the kindergarten? Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a fun game. So you kind of grow your own farm. Mm -hmm. Each of you grow your own farms. Okay. Ah, okay, there's a good, uh, good analogy. Animal Crossing. Did, have you played Animal Crossing? Mm -hmm. The moves is an Animal Crossing, guys? Mm -hmm. Would you transmit data from Animal Crossing farm bills using TCP or UDP? Well, you spend a lot of effort trying to steal something from the neighboring farm. Okay. Would you like it being recorded by the server or the server can occasionally um, not getting it? All right. Okay, so that game, TCP or UDP. Second game. Okay, Park G. Hey, wait, Park G? Yeah, Park G, Park G. Park G. Um, have, you come, have you played this game? Some of you might, some of you might not. Okay. It's a shooting game. So the last one surviving wins the game. Okay. Gets it all. Winner takes it all. So would you mind sending the data through TCP? Or would you prefer sending it using UDP? Mm. Ouch. Right? You do want the you know shooting events being recorded reliably and in a short amount of time. Ouch. Uh, and the third one, I think there's uh, you know th there's still a version of it. Uh, uh, but more in the mobile platform now. Uh, Recknup Online, R-O. It's a role-playing game according to former students. Okay. So it seems that for a lot of players, what you do there is just uh, sit there and chat with your game friends. Okay. Or you shop and purchase um, items that's gonna make you stronger okay, in fights of you know, major monsters. So for these three games, so R-O is a little bit complicated. Most of the time, nothing. But when you are in a quest, right? Working in a guild, trying to come back a huge monster, and there are 20, 40 of you, okay? 
Would you care data being reliably transferred or not? Or whether the data get uh, transferred in a short delay or not? Maybe for some game plays using more reliable transfer and some game plays, it's okay to use just UDP. I don't know. Okay, find your teammates. Yeah, so guys, working, find your teammate, okay? Line them up, ch chat with them, and see. What do you think you should use, TCP or UDP, for each of these three games? That's for display. Boot up again.
interesting. All right. Good. I see that uh, some of the guys on uh, the remote locations are already typing things up. Good. So let's see. Uh, I think Ziya. Oh, okay. So that was actually a question. Does UDP have shorter delay if it doesn't? Do full control and condition control. Ah, okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yes, uh, UDP typically uh, give us shorter delay. Okay, Ziya. If that helps you to think further. So I think uh, Jingxiang here is uh, providing something. For gamers, uh, for games, players require instant interaction. So UDP is a better option, I see, with shorter transmission time. Although UDP may result in data loss, the whole game still continues. In this case, we may at most experience the so-called lag. All right. So Zhan Jingxiang, uh, Jingxiang, I think, uh, what team are you? Mm. Oh, there, Team 10 is thinking that, hey, UDP all the way, okay, because uh, all of them preferring shorter delay, okay. But, uh, but what about loss? Okay, any of you guys would say, okay, let me check also the, the, oh, okay, there. James is, James and Yoda is Yoda is saying UDP better. Yeah. Okay, games are loss tolerant. So get a automatic shooting gun, right, when you're playing PUBG. But usually they don't go rank, long range. So it's a little bit tricky with the shooting game. We like TCP better, so Samuel and Jean obviously uh, take it another way because save points, uh, save points of games are loss intolerant, I see. Okay, so maybe you will go to an internet cafe where the delay tend to be shorter because uh, usually the internet cafes are directly co connected to ISP. There could be a ethernet, native ethernet connection instead of using ADSL or cable. Team number one, uh, Junting, Ziting, and Hongxuan. I think Farmville and RO are TCP, and PUBG is UDP. Ah. Okay, shooting game. Uh huh. Yeah, well, you could lose a few shots uh, while playing it. Yeah, so keep shooting, right? And Ethan here. You pick TCP over a uh, UDP over TCP because games require real time updates. Mm -hmm. 
Jing mm -hmm. actually answered it already on YouTube. And Shi Wei. Oh, wow. Okay, so it's very elaborated. So Shi Wei is actually having different solutions for different games. So let's take a look. Team 2. It doesn't need time accuracy. Ah, okay. The data need to be reliable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for game one, mm. Shi Wei is picking TCP. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, because game one is not that real time, isn't it? Mm. So TCP will be fine. Mm -hmm. And yet you might satisfy users who are a little bit picky about whether their events get saved reliably. Okay, good. What about A2? Pop G, ah, okay, so Shi Wei is saying, Team 2 is thinking, uh, for Pop G, it should be UDP. Hmm. If the data are transmitted slowly, it's just like being lost anyway. Ah, okay. Yeah. You may find someone not dying <laughs> just after you're shooting them. Say so since the message that yeah, I think it, that did happen right. Some from time to time when you when you play PUBG, um, so chances high that PUBG is uh, implementing in UDP as well, or it's just that the data arrived too late um, and it's you know like it's not happening. It's not happening. Uh, even if two of the da 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 yeah. So if you missed out a couple shots out of a hundred, it doesn't you know hurt all that much. R O is TCP. Okay, I see. I think uh, Shi Wei here is um, thinking more towards how real time mm, things need to be. Okay. So the logic seems to be behind whether the game data needs to be more real time or less real time. If it needs to be more real time than UDP, if it doesn't need to be all that real time TCP, okay, that's reasonable. One way to think about it, definitely. And uh, let's see, uh, Team Six here, Angela. We would prefer using UDP. All right. Okay. Yeah, very similar to some of the students. Okay, pub. G, very real time UDP. And you pick UDP for RO, okay, and TCP for Farmville. Okay. So in your mind, RO is somewhat also real time. So do you have played RO? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Anyone who has played RO before? Is it real time? No? You don't know. So you see, if you did, if you never play the time, it's hard to tell. Mm. Uh, if you never play the game, it's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, Pei Yu, okay, team eleven, uh, nineteen. From VLR OTCP, PUBG UDP, just like team two. All right. So Pei Yu is over there. Mm -hmm. uh, Lin Bo Ah, oh, okay, team uh, team four. Over there to the left. Mm -hmm. TCP, TCP, oh, TCP all the way. All right. Yeah, I think it makes sense, isn't it? You use TCP and you go to Internet Cafe to play PUBG. Mm -hmm. Or make sure that you have short delay to access the Internet from home when it's an important game. Team 9, uh, Yi Ting and Jie Wen. From the RO, TCP. And PUBG, UDP. Mm. Kevin, Team 7, TCP Farmville, but the other two. Oh, okay, so just uh, Farmville here. Oh, but uh, Kevin gets a lot of fruits. Okay. Carrots, <laughs> apples, <laughs> broccoli. Okay. Uh, Kevin likes Farmville. Okay, let's give them. That, okay, so pineapple, all right, pineapple. This, what is this? Ah, tomatoes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I need to know how you guys find these. Okay, so Kevin, congratulations. Your Farmville game is uh, well accepted. Okay, people, oh, look at this ad plan. And Kevin, Kevin from Team 15, PUBG UDP, Farmville ROTCP. Very good. So let's try to summarize things. You see, okay, PUBG, more people thinking UDP, right? Because we all know first person shooting game, very sensitive to delay. Farmville, not sensitive to delay at all, TCP. And then RO in the middle. Some say TCP, some say UDP. Mm -hmm. I guess it's your choice. There's no one correct answer. Mm -hmm. Some might implement uh, Farmville with UDP. Why not? Mm -hmm. It might be a very competitive farming game. Uh -huh. Real time shooting farming game, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Shooting the vegetables, for example. Throwing vegetables at each other. All right, good. I think this is a very good discussion because, you see, every app designers, okay, not just game designers, they will need to think about what is the nature of the application and therefore select the underlying protocol accordingly. Right? Good, let's take a break and we'll resume the lectures in 10 minutes, so that is uh, 3, oh, okay, it's already 11, so let's still resume at uh, 3, uh, 2.20. Strawberry. <laughs>
as that comes, this is the second. This, this code is the right uh, line, but without the without the enter. So it shows this case, but when I add the enter at the end, it is different. It doesn't respond at all. Yeah, and and this case is is only on the right two lines, and the second line there's no enter in the end. So so it responds, and the and the result is consistent. But when there are three lines, <coughs> there's no response. Mm, very so interesting. Okay. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> what is the result? To, to be honest, I don't know either. It has something to do with the <laughs> and the adjective that you're using to do the enter or not enter. Um, so have you tried? Have you tried to take it? So you, you could just read the files on the TSD file, then you may not encounter this. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it is supposed to read uh, uh, all the bytes there. But the thing is that um, there are some bytes that are um, non-printable characters, like enter, uh, like new line, like uh, new uh, end of file. And so how these uh, new line or end of file are being added <laughs> to the text file, it's up to the editor. So some editors might do interesting things because uh, when you show a text file, right, as long as you look the same, look like a normal text with a new line, then it's okay. But they might be pending new lines with the character cartridge return. Sometimes it's cartridge return not the new line. Um, it's partly the editor issue, but it's also partly the system issue, operating system issue, Mac versus Windows. Um, this is a very good question, because many students have the same problem. So that's why I posted the message here. Okay, okay so, so the, the goal of PA3 is not <laughs> Make sure that you understand all these tricks about uh, if you enter and uh, if you hit enter for one editor, uh, what's being pended there? Is it end of line, end of file, or what kind of end of line? Okay, so there are multiple end of lines. Mm. Uh, so to avoid troubleshooting the text file <laughs> for testing, okay, uh, just uh, go to the server, okay, curl curl this file, client101.go. Okay. This is a text file that I created from the server okay. using a very simple editor. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that this server will give you the consistent number of bytes okay, reading. And after the ser server replies, it will be the right number. Okay, okay so test uh, your server with uh, this file. So if uh, the system at the server asks you enter the file name, uh, just say client101.go and see if the numbers are consistent. Okay. If your PA3.go is consistent uh, and it works just like Polly's PA3.go, then you're fine. Okay, so then you don't have to troubleshoot whether it's your editor or the operating system or what. Because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a historical problem. <laughs> It's a historical problem. Uh, not just operating systems, but also the editors. Mm. You see, when you are doing editor in Windows, in Microsoft Office, you had to hit enter. Uh, uh, I think some time ago, you can actually say, show the end of line symbol. Mm. Uh, so every editor might add something extra there, uh, and you don't see. So, but those will all be counted uh, by Golan's uh, skin. Uh, so if the files you're using to do the testing is not quite uh, what I was assuming, then you get this issue. What the PA3 server that I'm, the sample, poly PA3 is assuming. So if the assumption that I have 
generating the survey to the assumptions. You don't have assumptions because I don't know what editors you're using and what operating system you're using. Okay? So use this uh, as a test. Uh, get it done first and then you can investigate. Uh, uh, so there's uh, differences in the end of five for different operating systems. So in LSL, how, how will LSL show, show the bytes? Uh, <coughs> very interesting. And, and very also show the bytes right, of the right, file. Right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to try oh. <laughs> a little bit to find out. Uh -huh. okay. uh, uh, the operating system shows a number, right? Mm. Uh, how is that number uh, calculated? Uh, I think it's still on all the symbols, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you are uploading a Windows file, a text file, you generate it using your editor to it. Um, whatever that you have inputted it there, visible or not, a printable or not, will mm -hmm. all go on OS. So the OS, I guess it's just counting the bytes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Golan server there, I'm assuming, uh, also counting bytes, but it's actually excluding the end of a line. Mm. Mm. And if the end of the line, there are more bytes. Mm. It's not just uh, in in Mac OS, it's just slash and zero equal character. Mm. Uh, if editor adds more characters at the end, no, I do very simple. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, end of line, or the end of line, and that's it, it's just how it goes. Or slash R, that's how it goes. Uh, this is just the editor might add uh, something extra. Mm. Mm, they look yeah. the same, but uh, they are not the same. Yeah. Well, they probably not. Okay. The first uh, mm. new line, the whole mm. thing, the exclude the other. I'll just say the whole thing, 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 the whole all right, uh, but hey, that would be PA4, in fact. Oh. <laughs> then you can try if your PA4 will work for Windows file. Uh, very good question. Mm. Alright guys, let's uh, resume the lecture. So that was the quiz. Okay. And next uh, is going to be a video and that is going to talk about secure, securing TCP. Alright, secure TCP, this is the next topic. Yeah, if you recall, when we were talking about these service requirements, right, there are four of them. Reliability, which is supported by TCP. Um, delay requirement, right, um, which is somewhat supported by using UDP. Uh, bandwidth requirement, and that might be better supported by UDP, but TCP might do a reasonable job. But the fourth, security. Yeah, the fact is that TCP and UDP, none of them uh, provide security. There's no encryption at all. If we send passwords through the internet uh, straight using TCP or UDP, it's essentially clear text. Uh, if there's someone intercepting the message, that someone gets access to our bank accounts or gets into our Amazon.com's account. So none of these cases are as good big money loss potentially involved. So demand is growing, therefore there is need of these uh, secure layers. So this is secure socket layer. 
So what it means is that before message, messages go through the socket and go out on the internet, let's make sure that it's secure. Okay. So it's to provide uh, encryption to messages that's going into uh, a TCP socket. Uh, as a result, then we can encrypt messages uh, using a key or we could verify the receiver uh, using a certificate. So this is uh, just as important as uh, trying to make sure that the data is confidential, okay? Because uh, um, how do you know if this server that you are contacting to is indeed uh, a Google server, right? Uh, how do you know if it's indeed your bank's server? So this is to identify whether the person you're talking to is indeed the person you're expecting. This is just to make sure that uh, no one can understand the message. No third person can, un can understand the message. Okay. And SSL is at application layer. Yeah, it's on top of TCP, therefore it falls in the application layer. But it's also right underneath the application layer protocol, so message goes through the application layer protocol, and then to the SSL, and then to TCP. Okay, so this picture below illustrates what I meant here. So SSL right here, right underneath the application layer protocol, but right above the transport layer protocol. Last, SSL socket API. Yeah, to implement SSL, uh, there are APIs available for each programming languages. In chapter A, you will see uh, Python's API to try to encrypt messages before they send messages out uh, to TCP socket. Now, uh, in this semester, towards the end, one of the PAs, you will also be exercising the APIs in Golan to do secure TCP. Uh, but there, we'll be using this, TLS, Transport Layer Security Support. Yeah, uh, this is actually a newer term uh, for SSL. So nowadays people don't call the security support over TCP SSL. Uh, they are all referred to as the TLS. Okay. Uh, if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because um, hey, SSL there is not really a layer. Uh, it's more a support for security. All right. Next, uh, let's explain how TLS works. Uh, before that, let me go back to the very fundamental computer security. Um, how do you encrypt a message such that uh, it can be kept as a secret? So the classic approach is uh, the secret key mechanism. So what we do there is to generate a key. And we share the key with Bob. And Alice. So when Alice has a message to send, yeah, use that key K, uh, apply the encryption function, and it's going to generate something that's messy. So a third party in the middle here might intercept the message, but without knowing the key, it's not able to decrypt it. Bob, on the other hand, receiving the messy message using the key can restore the original message. Okay, so this is the classic secret key uh, communication. Unfortunately, the secret key system will not work to implement TLS. If you think about it, we have one shared secret key. Let's say if Alice is the one generating the secret key. Alice is yet to send the secret key to Bob, isn't it? I mean, then we need TLS because we fear we send password in clear text to the other end. So Alice here is sending the shared secret key in clear text to Bob. Same problem. Yeah, so we do have a bootstrap problem with the secret key. Now, to address that problem, we use this other system on top of secret key. It's called the public key system. 
So instead of using one share key, public key system generates a key pair. One is called the private key, the other is called the public key. Alright, so the receiver of the secret message is over here. Sender of the secret message is on the other side. What the sender does is uh, to plug the message he she wants to send and then encrypt it with the receiver's public key. Yeah, the reason that it's called a public key is exactly because R is going to give out that key to the public, public including the sender here. Okay, let me take a pause here. Mm -hmm. So this R over here, okay, when it's using public key, uh, each time it generates two key. One private, the other public. Private is only kept within himself. Public is give out to anyone who wants to communicate secretly with uh, the receiver. So S here, the sender, has receiver's public key. So this R pop here is used to encrypt the message to send. So this is gonna scramble the origin. So this function is essentially scrambling the original bits here using this particular parameter. So the encrypted uh, message, as it arrives at the receiver, receiver there, then apply the same function and take the receive message. And receiver can decrypt with the other key in the key pair. So this is going to give the original message back. Now. The private key is the one kept by the receiver and no one else in the world will know. Therefore, you ensure that no one else will be able to decrypt the encrypted message. So only the receiver can see uh, the original message. So this is how the public key ensure secret exchange. Okay, so in magic is in this function here. It's the same function. Given this function, uh, the public key system can generate two very long integers. Okay. And they can kind of inter-decrypt, encrypt each other. Given this function, private key encrypts the data and public key decrypts it. Public key decrypt, uh, encrypts data Private key decrypts it. Really interesting. So TLS illustrated up here here uh, works this way. LS here is a client requesting service from Bob here, a server. So client here first sends hello message to the server. Server in response sends server's public key. So Alice here can then encrypt the shared secret uh, that has been generated before using Bob's public key. So Bob's public key here. Then encrypted master key will arrive at the Bob side. And because Bob is the only one holding the Bob's private key. Therefore, Bob can restore the master key from ENS. And that's how Bob and Alice establishes the shared secret key. So in this case, you see Alice is, one, is the one generating the secret key. And from then on, all the messages are encrypted using the master secret key. And that's how TLS worked. So you see, eventually after the TLS session as, as is established, all the rest of the data are encrypted using the shared master key. Okay? Only the first section, the first exchange, hello, 
of a key and encrypted ma master key. Okay, so this part is using the public key system. And that takes us back to the discussion. Here. Oh, no, 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 I should not be doing this. I hope that it's, it's, let me just check whether the remote students are seeing it. I think, good, very good. Uh, any question here? Polly in the video is not moving. Yes, I was frozen there. Yeah. In the security video, uh, the video talking about the public key. All right, so let's have a short discussion here. How does one pass a secret? Okay, thinking about that you want to pass a note to another uh, classmate, okay, from one end to another, another end. How would you do that? You write secrets in the note. Do you just hand it over to the person sitting next to you and ask them to pass it over? You can, right? Yeah, so in a computer system, in a communication system, of course, right? You generate the master key for all the subsequent data to encrypt. Uh, but uh, how do you pass that master key? Can you come up with something like public key for real person-person communication? Think about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, another issue is this. How do you know if Bob is Bob? Okay, in this exchange above here. Okay, Alice is saying hello to Bob, right? Uh, Bob is sending a public key. But how does Alice know, right? This is this is the Bob she is looking to speak with. Because provided the public key, Alice sends the master key, uh, and the hacker here decrypt for the master key, and the hacker can then follow what Alice wants to send. So that's what the certificate here is used for. Okay, for such a certificate, usually, um, you generate and then uh, pay a authority to keep it so that Alice can check whether the certificate is really valid. So when we're working on PA9, okay, you will have to generate certificates for yourself in order for a TOS sessions to work. Certificate, what is, what, what is it? Um, ah, recall, during midterm, right, I, uh, TA asked all the remote students to show ID with a matching photo, then we certify the students uh -huh, are indeed the students taking the exam. So the certificates are for that purpose. So obviously between Bob and the third party authority, uh, there's some more exchange in order to verify uh, Bob is indeed the person uh, Bob is claiming. Okay, so maybe checking the IDs. All right, so it's not that easy to make the internet secure. But luckily, we're done with uh, 2.1, uh, the overview. I understand uh, what we were talking about until this point, they are all very simple. Nothing is really tricky, but you see, in computer network, this is, a, this is something for communication, okay? The goal is to make sure the communication is smooth, okay? The goal is not exactly to make sure that the secret is really, really secretive, okay? So much of the design are more system, okay? Making sure that things will work reliably, all right? There's very little math, okay? Um, and now we move to the first application. By the way, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2 all the way to 2.6, none of these are really difficult, okay? It's just that you need to know how things work. All right, so this is the easiest slide. 
it explains, okay, what is the web page? Okay, inside the web page, there are multiple objects, okay, such as an HTML file, such as a embedded image, okay, a photo in your homepage, for example. Uh, an audio file, when you start the page, uh, the sound plays out. Okay, there could be a JavaScript in the meantime, okay, doing something. So a web page consists of a base HTML file, okay, and inside this base HTML file, there will be references to the additional objects, right? So these additional objects are what I'm saying here, several reference objects. Each object is identified by this URL. Uh, you guys all know, because we kind of use it every day, and you probably see the term already, uniform resource locator. Uh, it, it's not very important exactly how you spell that out. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be on the exam either, okay? Because uh, maybe 20 minutes later, we'll forget okay, what URL stands for. What's important is that each object okay, is uniquely identified by the URL, which looks like this. Uh, two parts, the host name and the path name. So that's usually the directory in the web server and exactly the file name okay, of the object you're fetching. Now what I want to emphasize just a little bit more is this. Okay? The base HTML file is usually the first object okay, the client retrieves. After seeing the base HTML file, then we see all the other URLs in the embedded in the reference objects. Right? And then the HTTP protocol. It works in a very, very simple way. I cannot be showing the animation of unfortunately. Okay. So you see here is this big server, uh, a web server running. By the way, Apache. Okay, is uh, just the brand name of a web server. It's open source, uh, very reliable uh, after people working on it over the years. So here is a client, a PC running uh, Firefox, a web browser. So the web, uh, the HTTP client side is part of the implementation of the web browser. Okay, so Firefox has that part. Chrome has also that part. Okay, Safari too. And the HTTP server part is running inside the Apache web server. So the way it works, very simple. The client sends HTTP requests and server sends back HTTP response. Right? So HTTP there is the web applications layer protocol. Okay. And it works in a client server model. Client is the browser sending requests, server sends, therefore, response. Client there receiving the response will then display the web objects, and that's it. So another example here, similarly, request, response. Okay, fine, it's not exactly all that simple, but uh, not more complicated, not much more complicated either. Before the HTTP request and response can be sent, yeah, between the client and server, ah, a TCP connection needs to be established. Right? So the messages will go in these, uh, this TCP connection. So before HTTP request message can go out, the client will initi initiate a TCP connection. Right? So that will go to server port 80 server accepts the connection, sends back a response to the client. So that establishes the TCP connection, and then the client side sends the request, server side sends the respo response. When the object is fetched, TCP connection closed, right? In the application layer, you see, exchange is just one round trip. But looking into the transport layer, you see also establishing the TCP connection. So one round trip for TCP connection establishment and one round trip for the HTTP message exchange. Right? HTTP is a stateless protocol. That means the server does not maintain any special information about the client. Right? 
There are some other protocols that do maintain states. Um, so they are kept past history, histories of how the client accessed the website. So previously, if you've been to, um, you know, shopping for a headphone. Uh, previously, you've been to um, uh, to places where you um, shop for a speaker. Okay. Next, the website might recommend you to uh, check out a particular TV uh, a monitor. Okay, because you seems to be very interesting in the audio systems. Okay. So some mm, protocols might track the past history. But the thing is, uh, the, but the thing is that the protocols that maintain states, okay, might know a little bit of uh, the user's past history, but in case either side, server or client side, crashes, there could be mismatch between the states of the two sides. So there needs to be some uh, consolations being done, okay, to fix okay, the inconsistency. Points here. HTTP being stateless is very simple. Okay? Less opportunities of bugs and less memory requirement. <coughs> All right, so this is a very important site. Mm. One wrong trip for TCP connection establishment, one wrong trip to get a web object. But that's not the only way it works. Recall. Uh, in a web page, oftentimes you come, you, you see uh, ten other reference objects. Okay. Then you need to do TCP connection and uh, request response for each of the objects. That can be pretty long time. Okay. So non-persistent HTTP is exactly what we we just described. At most, one object per TCP connection. So once that object arrives at the client, connection is closed. So if we want to download multiple objects, we start multiple connections and redo everything again. So to prevent uh, repeatedly starting a TCP connection and closing it, persistent HTTP, this is a later model of HTTP that do this. It sends multiple objects over one single TCP connection, okay, between the client and server. So, quickly recap the non-persistent HTTP connections way of sending it. Okay, so this is um, someone wants to get um, and get this web page, some school.edu, some department home.index. Therefore, the client here initiates a TCP connection to the server. Okay, server here accepts the TCP connection, sends back an OK connection, open, and then HTTP client here starts to send the request message. Server here receives the request message and sends back response message. And in the meantime, close the connection. This is non-persistent HTTP. After the object is sent, server side immediately initiate closing of the connection. Client here will receive the object and close the connection as well. But immediately reading into the HTML document, the base HTML, it finds that, oh, there are 10 more reference objects. Then for each of those, we repeat repeat step one to five to get each of these 10 objects. If we calculate uh, the response time, so response time is the time for the client to start sending, uh, trying to initiate connection all the way to receiving the object. So it will be here, client over here, server over here, client initiating connection, and receiving finally the object. So this amount of time is the response time. Right? Uh, Rock trip time we know. It's the time it takes to go to the other end and comes back. So you see here, initiating TCP connection takes one round trip time. And then for file request and the response to come back, another round trip time. 
And then, of course, the object uh, to transmit it might take some time. So the overall response time in a non-persistent HTTP connection is this much. Two round trip time plus file transmission time. All right. So here, non-persistent HTTP, it takes two round trip time plus the time to transmit the object. Now that can take a long time, right? In that example earlier, we had 10 objects. How many round trip times? 10 objects, 20 round trip times, right? And the base object, two round trip times. Altogether, 22 round trip times. What is the round trip time from Taiwan to US? Probably 200 milliseconds. Uh, in the midterm exam, right, to Eurocom, how long? 200 milliseconds, maybe more. And 22 of 200 milliseconds, how much is that? Well, that will take several seconds, in fact, isn't it? So that's very long. So in the non-persistent HTTP uh, version, a lot of times what browser, browser is doing to try to reduce the connect, uh, connection or the response time is this, to open parallel connections. So for these 10 objects that are yet to be downloaded, uh, for each of them, open the TCP connection instead of serializing the request. Okay. Instead of sending one request and then the second one, uh, wait until the second one is received and the third one, 10 parallel connections being started at the same time, and then 10 responses coming at the same time. Okay, So with 10 parallel TCP connections, you take one round trip time to open connections and another round trip time to get all 10 objects. Do you like this approach? Think about it. Let's move to persistent HTTP. This is an alternative. If you're still debating, mm -hmm. you don't feel quite good about it. Oh, all these 10 TCP connections, right? I still need to send messages, mm -hmm. right? 10 client messages and 10 server reply to establish 10 TCP connections. This persistent HTTP here says, let's send multiple objects to the same connection we have started in the first place. So server here will not close the connection immediately after sending out the object. So after sending the response, the connection is kept. Subsequent HTTP messages that the client discovered that he needs to download uh, will just go on to the same connection. So use this connection that has been opened at the first place and reuse it. So client sends all the subsequent re requests to the same connection. And so it's also one round trip time to get all the reference objects down. And yet there's no more, no 10 more uh, messages from the TCP client to send the initiation request and there's now these uh, 10 messages from the server side to say hey connection established all right so that was the distinction between non-persistent and persistent tcp connect uh, persistent http connection mode so in http protocol we do have some variations okay it's not that simple okay one round trip one round trip done it can be one round trip, uh, multiple objects in another round trip in the same connection being done. So the discussion here is, okay, let me ask you, the time to download the web page okay, of one base HTML, and inside the base uh, HTML, there are five reference objects. Okay. If we're doing it using the non-persistent HTTP, mode, how long does it take? And if we're using persistent HTTP, how long does it take?
what will be the time for the first one? Non-persistent HTTP. Thinking. Anyone? Okay. Student in the back. Very close. Yeah, for five reference objects, right, each would take two RTTs. And if we add the, the two RTT for the base HTML, that would be 12. Yeah, so I was not very clear to say that uh, the download time for the entire uh, web page. And I think you are, let me guess. Uh, what about the second one? Using persistent HTTP. Six. Very interesting. One, two. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Six, do you agree? Uh, yeah, someone else is agreeing with you. And you are eating. And the one agreeing with you is, um, are you Jun Ting or Yi Ting? Yi Ting. Ting, okay. No, you are Zi Ting, okay. All right, lots of things. Uh -huh. Good, are we, are we clear? Yeah, pretty clear. And next, oh, okay, this part is a little bit messy. Let me think whether we have been, oh, sorry. I'm still in the habit of trying to uh, slide show the slides. Okay, let's see. So the video is a little bit long, but um, okay. So maybe we go over time just a little bit. All right. So the last part is going to be a video. We'll be switching here just a little bit and talk about the messages in HTTP protocol. Um, this is actually a very important part of an application layer protocol design. And we'll be using HTTP as an example to talk more. For all the application layer protocols coming up the rest of the chapter, we're just going to go real quick. Now, it's also important to spend some time here to talk about the messages in HTTP protocol because um, in the second half of the semester, you'll be implementing a web server. That means you will need to be able to interpret messages coming from the client. And you will also need to be able to generate the messages you need to be sending to the client. Okay. So, hey, receiving from the client, sending to the client. Yeah, those messages happens to be the HTTP request and HTTP response. Request is the one coming from the web browser to your web server. Response will be the messages you generate and send back to the client. All right. So there are two types, easy, and that is about the easiest part. Now, what comes a bit next, a complicated is next. Uh, let's look into an example of the HTTP request message. Here's one. I know, a bit messy, isn't it? Okay, but hey, bear with me. Let's read in. Get index.html HTTP slash 1.1. Uh, okay, not so bad. Uh, 
Uh -huh. Host, column, www.net.cs.ums.edu. Mm -hmm. mm, not so bad. I can probably guess what that means. User agent, column again. Firefox, oh, that's a web browser implementation, isn't it? 3.6.10, oh, probably the version number of the browser, mm, being a Firefox browser. And so, hey, accept language, EN US, probably English, US type of English. Mm -hmm, not so bad. Keep alive, 115, connection, keep alive. So maybe the, the connection is this type, the keep alive type. And maybe 115 is to specify how long the connection should be kept alive. So, Oh, until now, your experience is saying this. It's reasonably readable, mm -hmm. human readable. It doesn't take a computer to read and fully understand it. So yes, HTTP messages, including requests and responses, they are all text-based, very readable. Let's take a closer look at the syntax of uh, HTTP request message. First is the request line. It's only a single line, three tokens, separated by two spaces, one over here and one over here. First token indicates the command the client is issuing to the server. So get here is the most classic command. Second token here indicates which object uh, the client is wishing to download. So here you see the path and the file name of the object. Third token is very straightforward. It's simply telling the server the version of the HTTP protocol the client is implementing. Now, header lines. Syntax is also quite straightforward. Column in the middle. Before the column, this is called the attribute or the field name and whatever comes after the column is the value of the attribute or the value of the field name all right so user agent is a well-defined attribute in http it indicates what implementation uh, the browser is and the version of it so user agent indicating the meaning being user is using a browser agent browsing agent called firefox and it's version 3.6.10 of Firefox. Okay, similarly, okay, keep alive, also a predefined attribute. And the value 115 is saying that let's keep the connection alive for 115 seconds if there are no messages being sent. Connection indicates the type of connection the uh, client is wishing to establish. It's the keep alive kind of connection. And so you see the syntax and a little bit of semantics of HTTP request. Next, uh, the general format. Okay, now with that introduction, with the specific example of HTTP request, so this will be slightly easier. You see here, first is the request line. And then we get a whole bunch of these header lines and it ends with what? CRLF. Okay, in fact, at the end of every line, CRLF, CRLF. Okay. And in the request line, we have three components the method, the argument for the method, and the version. Okay. Some comments might not contain the second component. All right. And you see here for each header line, we see what? Pair of attribute name and value. So in the slide we see this is the header field name. So the, those attributes are sometimes also called the fields, the field names. So attribute value or field name value. Good. So lots of these. Okay. And hey, this is the thing that we did not see in the previous example. Yeah. 
Occasionally, you do need to have a body in the HTTP request message. And this is what, if you recall, the post comment. We're sometimes posting content, posting data onto the server. So those data, those information to be communicated from the client and to be registered at the server will be here in the entity body. So real data uh, generated by the user is here. Okay. So officially in general form, the HTTP request comes in three parts, request line, header lines, and body. But all right, so that's uh, kind of end here. Just four minutes, but uh, it should be relatively easy. Let's move on to the next quiz. Okay, this is uh, quiz seven. Uh, so this is an HTTP request message okay, that we have actually sniffed using a tool called WingDump. Okay. One can actually try to do it on a Windows machine. So looking through the content here, Q1 is asking, what is the URL of the document being requested? Q2, is it a non-persistent or a persistent connection being requested? Did you identify the URL? Simple, not that simple. See, team seven is saying ah slash cs four five three slash index html. If it's a uh, persistent, Angela is saying the same. Mm -hmm. uh, who's Lin Pei? You? Okay. Okay, Lin Pei. Uh, it's saying, oh, the URL should be gaia.cs.umass.edu slash cs453. Ah, you, get, uh, you got it perfectly right. And the connection type is persistent. Oh, because you see that there's uh, something called keep alive, isn't it? Connection, keep alive, down below here. Very insightful, very insightful. Uh, Boshin, team six. No, not team six, team four. Ah, uh, okay, over that. All right, good. I think this is a very good ending today.
Oh, okay, good. I see uh, more answers popping up. All right. Great. So these teams, so you're pretty much done with the quizzes. Uh, this uh, well, first half of this week. Uh, on Thursday, there's going to be one more quiz. All right. And with this, um, that's all for today. Time okay. online. Uh, I'm going to end the streaming now. Okay. Thank you for your participation.